<laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Clark. Uh, for those who don't know, why is he laughing? Uh, because this is take three. Anyway, uh, uh, good morning. This is don't 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 tell me this is Sunday, March the sixth, the fifth. Oh, okay. One of these days I'll get it right. Uh, good to have you here with us. And uh, in case you're wondering, yes, I am Scott Allred. I did have a haircut last week. I had somebody come up to me on Sunday. In fact, it was Dick from Choir, and he comes up and he says, I'm looking for Scott. I don't see him anywhere here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we fi finally got to uh, get over to our barber, beauty, whatever you're going to call it. And we both had our haircuts on Saturday. And so, uh, and then it was weird. I went outside, went to Rayleigh's to, to do some shopping for, for dinner, and my head was cold. It was 45 degrees outside. And I didn't have a hat on it. Okay, enough of that. Hey, it's good to have you here. This is a second week in Lent as I'm continuing my sermon series, uh, Doers of the Word. We are still in the book of Matthew and going a little bit further to look at Matthew chapter 13, what is called the parable of the sower. It's interesting is I was 12, maybe 13, and I, I read this scripture passage and I thought oh I know what he's talking about these seeds and these these are us and then when I went on reading it where Jesus actually describes what's going on I thought to myself did I really just kind of figure that out or have I heard this before I mean I, I simply didn't know I was so oh, oh I, I'm, I've got wisdom I understand these things but this particular passage is is a uh, I like it, and I think many times it's misunderstood because what we need to understand before I even read it is all four soils that Jesus mentions here are people who are reading and receiving the Word of God. So he's not. this is not a comparison of those in the church versus those out of the church. These are us. And so before I even read it, I have to ask ourselves, which one are we? Or which one do we desire to be? Let's pray. God, we thank you again for this second week in Lent as we're coming up to, to the great celebration of Easter, the, 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 the crowning time of our faith, the beginning of uh, the beginning of our faith, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We thank you for that. But as we continue in Lent, uh, Lord, the challenge of being doers of the word, doing more than just reading it, Lord, lead us in this they lead us in your scripture. We thank you and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Matthew 13 from the New International Translation. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Now stop right there before I go any further. If you've never been to the Lake of Galilee, and by the way, folks, it is a lake, it's not a sea, it's fresh water, and it's about the size of Lake Tahoe. It is a lake. But if you've never been there, all of the areas except for maybe one as it approaches the lake is on a downward slope. There's nowhere where you can get, you can walk flat. Otherwise, I think the water would just keep on going. So it's all a downward slope. And so he's there by Galilee, and there are people gathering, and so he gets in a boat and he goes out on the lake and then using the hillsides for a natural theater, he can sit out there in that boat and talk all day long without an amplification system and the people can hear him. It's really fascinating uh, when you're there. And so I can't help but seeing that in my mind when it says he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. They're gonna sit there with the hills behind them amplifying Jesus's voice and so he can talk to quite a large group there, which he does. And then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some feed, some fell, no, excuse me, I'm sorry. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places. Are there rocks in Israel, Larry? A couple. <laughs> 
There are so many rocks in Israel. You look at farm fields in Israel and, and you start to laugh because here's this big, huge boulder in the middle of the farm and the, the rows just go right around it. I mean, <laughs> You know, um, uh, my friend Mishi once said, if we spent time picking up all the rocks, we'd never have a time to, to farm anything. There is a uh, old Israeli proverb that says, when God finished creating the earth, he had a bag of rocks left over. And one of his angels said, what are you gonna do with that? And he says, I don't know, dump it on Israel. So <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of rocks. And so when Jesus is saying this parable, some fell upon rocky soil. Well, if you're there, yeah, you can see how that can happen. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Going on, even though I don't think it's, it's written up there. No, it's not. It, we, we, according to what I have there, we stopped there. But I want to read a little bit more. Because actually, I, something here is kind of hilarious again to me. It depends on your point of view. But the disciples came to him and he said, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And Jesus said to them, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will more be given, and, and whoever will ha and that person will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they do not have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Now, please understand, they're coming up and saying, Lord, why, why do you teach in parables? And he says, to you, I don't have to because you know all the secrets. But to them, I have to speak in parables. And you say, Scott, what's so funny about that? Well, <laughs> here's... Here's what's funny to me about that. Going down to verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. I, I, these guys get to sit there and listen to the living and active word of God. As Jesus walked on the earth, the word of God, whatever came out of Jesus' mouth was right there in their presence. He said, there's many people who've come before you who didn't get to have this opportunity. What a wonderful opportunity. I'm not speaking to you in parables because you don't need them because you know all things. Okay, now here it comes. Then Jesus says in verse 18, but listen to the, what the parable of the sower means. Now, wait a minute. If he doesn't... <laughs> If he doesn't have to, to talk to them in parables because they already know, how come he has to explain what he just said? I, does that strike any of you a little weird? It has to me for years. If they know, then they, they, they know what this parable means. But apparently Jesus perceived they didn't really get it. And so he says, here it is. All right, this is what Jesus meant by that parable as recorded by Matthew from the very words out of Jesus' mouth. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom. So again, we're not talking about outsiders who've never heard the gospel. These are people hearing the message. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path which birds came along and ate. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky places is the person who hears the word at once, receives it with great joy. But since they have no root in themselves, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the person who hears the word but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the person who hears the word and understands it. They produce a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what is sown. 
Thus is the reading of God's holy word. May he grant us understanding today. I, I, I said to you that this parable of the sower is about the church. It's not about outsiders. Talking about people who are saying, I want to be a follower of God. I want to be a child of God. And four people are mentioned. The first one, anyone who hears the message of the kingdom, but yet doesn't understand it. The evil one comes along and snatches it away. Whatever was sown in their heart, the person goes nowhere. Now, here's the thing that comes to my mind when I read that. Somebody who, 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 who reads it and doesn't understand it. That's when we just snap the Bible shut and we say, this doesn't make any sense. And that's the end of it. Uh, look at Kairos 26 is coming up. And you should know that by now. I've been talking about it enough. And uh, I'm giving one of the final talks as a clergy, uh, and it's called Walking in God's Grace. And it, it is the longest talk of the entire event. It's five pages long, goes about 25 minutes long. And in there, there's a challenge to the men in blue. What will you do when this Kairos comes to an end? And one of the phrases in there is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And, and what it does is it challenges, what are you going to do when you go from here? Are you going to join a prayer and share group? Are you going to start going to chapel on Sunday mornings? Are you going to join a Bible study? Yes, folks, there are Bible studies inside Folsom Prison, led by other inmates. And some of these guys are pretty darn good. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to read it and say, I don't understand this. I'm going to shut it and walk away. Or do we go and try to find out what the word means? And I'm hoping, and, and by now, you, over a 12-year period, you should have heard me by now saying, I hope that you are in your word of God daily. And if you don't understand it, there are all kinds of things we can look at. We can look at commentaries. There are study Bibles that have other comments on the bottom to help the reader to try to understand what may be being said in the scripture text. Folks, if you say, I don't understand what I just read, what are you doing to learn? If the answer is nothing, well, then we fall away. We fall away. What did we look at last week? Depart from me. I do not know you. I don't want to hear that. I don't want anybody to hear that. What are you doing to learn and to know the word of God that you read? The second verse. This is the seed sown among, I'm sorry, that's the end of the first one, sown among the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky soil is the one who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes along because of the word, they quickly fall away. This person is a lot like the first person. They don't have any root in themselves because they are not doing their own personal study or doing whatever it is they can to try to understand the word in a deeper, more uh, enjoyable. That's not the word I'm looking for, but a more enriching process. But yet I, I read it. No, oh, I'm all excited. Oh boy, look, look what I just read. Look what I just read. But what happens if something comes along that is disturbing? that is hurtful, that is painful, even persecution. Now, I've said repeatedly, every atheist I have personally known in my life became an atheist because of a, 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 a terrible event in their life or the life of somebody they love. And they concluded God would not do this, or God would not allow this to happen. Now, I, I got to tell you something, folks. If I get cancer, it's not about God. God didn't say I'm going to give you cancer. Because even if I die of cancer, what still holds true, something that will never change if I'm in Christ Jesus? What can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. But if we buy especially in the teaching of, 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 of the uh, uh, 
the gospel that God wants you to be rich. Help me out. Prosperity. Prosperity gospel. Especially if you're in that teaching of the prosperity gospel that God wants you to be rich and great and nothing's ever going to happen to you. Guess what? Something comes along your life that, that is terrible and you're going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, where's God? Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk in the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thy rod and thy staff protect me. Nowhere in that psalm does the writer, who happens to be David, say, I will fear no evil because I know you won't let it touch me. That's not in scripture text. Job was a righteous man and he lost everything. Brothers and sisters, troubles will come our way. I had a TV repairman come into my house years ago. This is when I was still in Bakersfield. And, and uh, I told him I was a pastor, and we got to talking, and he says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm mad as hell at God. I said, why? Because my grandson died. And look it, I don't want my grandsons to die. And it would be devastating. But I asked the man, why are you mad at God? Because he wasn't supposed to let that happen. And I said, brother, I hate to tell you this, but nowhere in the scripture text does it say that we cannot die or be killed or whatever the case may be. What it does say is even though we die, yet shall we live again if we are in Christ Jesus. I said, look, God loves your grandson just as much now as he did before the grandson died. It doesn't have anything to do with God. A lot of us have bought into this thing that nothing evil is ever going to come our way. Or the other one that keeps getting said, don't worry, God won't let this come because he knows that you can't handle it. That's not in scripture either, folks. What it does say is God will not let you be tempted beyond that which you are able to endure. It never ever says God will not let something come your way that you, that you because God loves you and won't let it happen to you. That's not what it says, folks. Again, this person who's among the rocky soil, they, they're all excited, but something will come which will challenge the thing that they believe, which may not even be biblical, and they turn and they walk away. I have met too many people like And I've met people like this next one. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the person who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out, making it unfruitful. Please note there's two conditions there. First one is worries of life. I am just so worried. There's, a, there's, there's an old cliche you know, why worry when you can pray? But I think many of us reverse that. Why pray when I can worry? I, you know, I'm going to hold on to these things that disturb me. I'm going to worry about it. I have met people that have become so worried about things that are absolutely out of control that they have ulcers and they are killing themselves from the inside. What part of I will never leave you nor forsake you do we not understand if I am driving myself so crazy with worry that I'm harming my own life? My wife said years ago, her major in college was a child development. Now, the, the joke about somebody in a child development was they're looking for an MRS degree. You know what that was? MRS degree? What? Yes. To get married. I want to be a missus. I want to have kids. My wife was doing it as a pre-counseling degree. She wanted to be a high school guidance counselor. She was even working in a senior citizen center as a counselor. There was a time in my wife's life that's what she wanted to be. She didn't want to be a teacher at all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's how God's sense of humor works. But Francis once, once said, there is a huge difference between sympathy and empathy. So I can sympathize with somebody's trouble, with somebody's struggle, especially that person that's close to me. I can sympathize with them. You know, I, I, I know what you're going through. It's not always a good thing to say, but a lot of us say, I've been there. So what? You're not there with me right now. And it, it, you know, I, I like Job, after he lost everything, his 
three friends came up to him and didn't say a word for seven days. They didn't say, hey, Job, we know what it's like to lose everything. What good would that have done, Job? He's in the middle of something. But it's, it's, it's one thing to sympathize with somebody else and maybe even cry with them. But Francis said there's something else to empathize with somebody. To empathize is to take on their pain to the point to where I begin to just get torn up inside. Oh, do you know what's going on with Betty Lou? Yeah. Why is it ripping you apart? My wife said that that's part of the problem. As she was working in the senior center, she goes, we have, we have people there that are worried about their children and their grandchildren and decisions that they're making that has nothing to do with this person, but they've taken it all personal and they're just ripping themselves up. Worry, folks, will destroy us. What I find interesting in this one about the thorns is there's an exact opposite. What is that? I have wealth. You notice that? It, it, the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Now, those are two different things. Usually, if I have all kinds of wealth, what kind of worries do I have? Now, I can buy myself out of anything. I'm not worried about it. It's the exact opposite. I have so much, I don't need anything else, including God. what changed the life and ministry of Terry Cole Whitaker. She was a huge prosperity gospel preacher and she said she had the answer to the people who were in India living in poverty and dying. They didn't know it was their divine right to be rich. And so she went back to India and after talking with people who said, look at yeah, I'm dying, but it doesn't change my relationship with the God that I follow. She came back and said, I've been totally wrong. You can be poor and miserable and still know that God loves you. Riches have the tendency to take that out of our eye. I had a friend who was rich. And, and he, he told me about a book he read one time called Rich Christians in a Starving World. And the book was challenging people that, that are rich to look beyond your own means, beyond your own needs, and realize what you can do in the name of God to these people that have other needs that are way beyond yours. But often it's like, no, this is mine. I'm not... I'm not Riches can be just as bad as worry. And this is what Jesus is saying. And so I'm reading the word and, 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 and there it is in my life, but I let these outside things take me away from it, either because I don't need it or because I'm so worried about something I have no control over. I'm seeking or I am failing to seek the life of my God who saves me. And then finally, the last one. But the one who receives the word that fell on good soil is the one who hears the word and understands it. And they produce a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. They let the word of God come into their life. And then they begin to produce, in this case, produce a crop. What did we look, look at last week? Can a good seed, a good tree, tree produce bad fruit? No. Can a bad tree produce good fruit? No, but produce fruit. That is good. The idea, again, same thing. When the word of God comes into our lives and we receive it and we read it and we act upon it and we believe it and we understand it, then we begin to produce well, the word fruit isn't here. We produce a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. What do we do with the word of God, folks? Do we just take it in and say, thank you, God. I like it. I'll see you next week. Or do we say, Lord, I thank you for your word, for your teaching. Lord, show me where you want me to go with this that I might produce a crop that even outweighs the seeds I received by reading your word. What are we doing with it, folks? Are we doers of the word or do we worry? Are we doers of the word or do we let things that are out of our control take our mind off of God because I'm in trouble or 
trying times have come upon me or I'm in persecution. By the way, I've said this also many times. Persecution is not a proof, but it is a promise. Persecution is promised to all of us in Christ Jesus, folks. It's going to happen. Don't go, oh, Lord, look what's going on. G Jesus said at the last of the, uh, of the Beatitudes, blessed are you. For so they treated the prophets before you. Rejoice and be glad when what? When people hate you, persecute you, and falsely accuse you because of me. And that's the words of Jesus, folks. <laughs> the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, I guess. You know, a pessimist is a person who's in a room who has everything they ever want, but they won't touch any of it because they're afraid they might get electrocuted or that might have a disease on it somehow. Or, or do you know what will happen if I really try to take that money? I, I might become corrupt, so I just sit in the, in the room and do nothing. An optimist is somebody who sits in a room full of horse manure and is swimming through it. And you say, what in the world are you doing? That's horse manure. And the person turns around and says, yeah, but with all this manure, there's a pony in here somewhere. What are we doing with the word of God? Do we have the joy that is ours? I say, Lord, I thank you for your word. Today, I want to go out and I want to produce fruit. I want to produce a crop. Use me for your glory. Which one of the soils is your life? And if you find yourselves in one of the previous three, what are you doing to become the fourth? You might need to talk to somebody about that. Seek some time of counseling. Join a small group. Larry, how many times a week did you meet with Joe and Gary? Once a week. Once a week. For, for, how, for how long? Four years. Four years. And it was every Friday Friday morning you had breakfast and you guys prayed with each other. Yes. Now, look, look folks, these are, these are three men I highly admire. These are three men who I believe walk in Jesus very well. But yet, you just heard him say, every Friday, he and Gary and Joe got together, had breakfast, prayed for each other, shared their lives. That's how you grow in Jesus, folks. I will admit it. By the way, you know who has the hardest time with that? Pastors. We don't need it. It's one of the things that's often expressed when you go to pastoral seminars what are you doing to strengthen your life we sit around and we go well i pass to the church i don't need this oh yes we do and so do you and so do we what are you doing to make your life good soil god we thank you for your grace and i thank you for the promise that the seed that falls on good soil that lets it grow will produce up to a hundredfold. And that, of course, is for others to receive. Lord, use us as your people. And yes, in all of our lives, something comes along that is out of our control that, that scares us, that bothers us, that frightens us, that angers us. And we also know of things like that that happens to our, our, our friends, but God, we can pray for them. If we're empathizing with them to the point to where we're damaging our own soul, Lord, I, for me, that's sin. Lead us away from that. Let us be good soil, producing a crop a hundredfold, or maybe 60 or 30. God, we thank you for this. Guide us now as we go from here into the second week of Lent, again, anticipating Easter. We thank you, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go with God. Have a good day, folks. We'll see you soon.